Sometimes things do not go well. That, that's self-evident. But here's the rub. Sometimes when things are not going well, it's precisely that which is most valued that is the cause. Why? It's because the world is revealed through the template of your values. If the world you are seeing is not the world you want, therefore, it's time to examine your values. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. There's a famous experiment that I've alluded to a couple of times, I believe, in this lecture series. The Invisible Gorilla Experiment. And in, in the Invisible Gorilla Experiment, there's two teams of players, each with three members, one dressed in black and the other dressed in white. And each team is passing a basketball back and forth to the team members and milling about. Um, you see a video of them doing so. They basically fill the video screen and the white team is passing a basketball to the white team members and the black team is passing a basketball to the black team members. And your job, as, as far as the experimenter is concerned, is for you to count the number of times that the black, black team, yes, black team, passes the basketball back and forth. So that's what you do. So now you have an ambition and an aim and a value. And the ambition and the aim and the value, they're all the same thing. And that is to perform well at the task. Now the thing that's so cool about this, and this is really so cool, it's just unbelievably, it's just unbelievable that this is the case. It's like a complete validation of, of a certain element of the Buddhist worldview. Um, so they pass the ball for a couple of minutes and then the experimenter says to you, how many? And you say 15 and because you're happy and you're happy with yourself because you've been paying attention. And, and the experimenter says, yeah, that's right. Or maybe not. Maybe you missed one. And then the experimenter says, did you see the gorilla? And half of you say, what gorilla? Like, really? And, he, and the experimenter says, yes. And then he rewinds it and plays the video. And sure enough, in walks this guy in a gorilla suit, six foot three or so. Stands in the middle of the game, right in the middle of the game, the same size as the players, perfectly, obviously evident, beats his chest for like a second and a half, and then sort of saunters off. And half the people who watch the video don't see the gorilla, which is absolutely shocking. And what that means is that your ambitions blind you to the nature of reality. Now, they illuminate some reality. But they blind you to most of it. And that's fine because you're not, there's not a lot of you in some ways. You're a very pinpoint thing, like a laser beam. And so you just can't be attending to everything all the time. But one of the things that you might ask yourself once you know that is that if you're suffering dreadfully, then one possibility is that you're so fixed on the point, you're so fixed on a point, the fact that you're so fixed on the point that you're fixed on might be integrally related to why things are going so catastrophically wrong. Now, perhaps not, because, you know, there's a lot of arbitrariness about life. And perhaps you suffer even when you don't deserve to. That seems to happen in the book of Job, for example, because Job is a good guy and God has a bet with Satan, which seems like another relatively nasty thing to do, to let Satan just torture him. And he does quite nicely um, to see if he'll turn against God. And it, it seems like a rather playground sort of thing for God to engage in. But the point is, is that even in a document like the Old Testament, there's ample suggestion that sometimes people just get wiped out and hurt, even if they're living good moral lives, aiming properly and all that. There's an arbitrariness in life you, that's not eradicable. But it's possible that it's what you're clinging to that's hurting you. And it's even possible that it's the thing that you're clinging to the hardest that's hurting you the most. That could easily be someone you love. Like lots of times I see people in therapy and they're miserable for one reason or another. And sometimes it's because they have a very close relationship with a family member and that just isn't working. You know, the, the family member, for the sake of simplicity, will say, is not really oriented towards helping them have a good life. The family member is instead oriented towards making them as bloody miserable as you can possibly make anyone. And, and what would you say? Exploiting the, the bond between family members in order to enable that. And then, sometimes, the sacrifice that's necessary is either 
merely distancing yourself from that person, sometimes substantively, and sometimes seriously distancing yourself from them. Like, we don't talk anymore, ever. And so that's pretty damn rough, and it hurts, and all of that. But, but it's a good example of the fact that sometimes, in order to extract yourself from the miserable bit of chaos that you happen to be enmeshed in, you have to let go of what you love best. If the world you are seeing is not the world you want, therefore it's time to examine your values. That's really worth, it's really worth thinking about, you know, because the alternative too is to curse fate. Right, because if it isn't you, and there's nothing you can do to change, there isn't something you're doing that's wrong, then it's fate itself, it's the world itself, it's other people, let's say, because they're a huge part of the world, or it's the nature of the world itself, or, or it's God himself in whatever form you either believe in or don't believe in, because it's fundamentally all the same in the sort of situation that I'm describing. So, and one of the things that's really interesting, and I mentioned this before about the Israelites in the Old Testament, is that they... They got this right. It's really something because what happens to the Israelites over and over in the Old Testament is that they get all puffed up about how wonderful they are and then they make moral errors because they're arrogant and then God comes along and just cuts them into pieces for like generation after generation and then they wobble back to their feet and but they always maintain the same attitude which is we did something wrong. We did something wrong. It's like it's like a it's like an axiom rather than observation, is that if we're not, if things are not laying themselves out for us as they should be, then we cannot curse God. We have to look to ourselves. Well, and you think, well, why not curse God? Because maybe it's his fault. That's a really good question. And one of the things that I've tried to figure out over the last 30 years is, well, why not just curse God? Because there is this arbitrary element to existence, and we are vulnerable and there is a plenty of suffering and things are unfair like there's problems right there's injustice and unfairness and all of these things and, and endless suffering so why not just lay it at the feet of God and the, whether God exists or not in some sense by the way with regards to the metaphysics of this particular discussion is not relevant it's the point remains the same either way and the answer is as far as I can tell that if you refuse to take on the responsibility yourself and you attempt it to lay it at the feet of either society or being itself, then you instantly start to act in a way that makes everything much worse. Not only for you, but for everyone else, and maybe even for being itself. And so, no, it's not helpful. Now, if, you're, if you decide that it's you, you've got the problem, maybe that's not even true. Like, maybe you are someone who's being tortured by the bet between God and Satan, and like, too bad for you if that happens to be the case. But it still seems to be the appropriate thing for a human being who's standing on his or her own two feet in a proper manner to take the responsibility on for themselves, regardless of the counter-arguments that might be made against it. That's really something. It's time to rid yourself of your current presuppositions. I also think of that, it's a Deadwood issue, you know, one of the things you see with motifs like the the, 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 the phoenix. Remember when Harry Potter goes off to fight the basilisk that turns you to stone when you look at it. It's a dragon for all intents and purposes. Well, when he gets bitten by the, by the dragon and, 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 and poisoned, that's the dragon of chaos, right? The thing that turns you to stone when you look at it. When he gets bitten by it, then he's going to die. And yeah, well, if you get bitten by the thing that turns you to stone when you look at it, if it bites you, man, if you're not dead, you're going to wish you are. It's one of the two. And then the phoenix flies in and cries tears into the wound, and that heals him. And the phoenix is the thing that allows the dead wood to burn off occasionally, let's say. Well, it's, I think it's once every hundred years with the phoenix. And, of course, it's pretty dramatic. The whole damn bird has to go up in flames, and then there's nothing left but an egg. But there's a very serious message there, too, which is that, you know, you can compare yourself in some sense to a forest fire, to a forest, you know, and a forest has to burn now and then for the dead wood to clear so that the forest can actually maintain its continued existence. And if you stop the forest from burning for a prolonged period of time, which happened in the United States when they were trying to manage the forest fires too tightly, then all that happens is the dead wood 
accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and accumulates until the whole damn forest is dead wood and then lightning hits it and it burns so hot that it burns the topsoil off. And then there's nothing left, nothing grows. And so that's a good moral lesson, which is don't wait too long to let the damn dead wood burn off, you know? Maybe a little self-immolation on a daily basis might be preferable to burning yourself all the way down to the bedrock, you know, once every 20 years or so, because maybe there won't be anything left of you when you do that. Well, that happens to people all the time. I've seen that happen to people many, many times. The dead wood accumulates, the mess around them gathers, the chaos that they haven't dealt with accumulates, and then one day the spark comes and they burn so far and so fast that there's not enough left of them to recover. And then they're the people who've been eaten by the beast. They're the people who've been eaten by the dragon and now are inside its belly, another very common archetypal motif. And while maybe a hero will come along and rescue them, or maybe they'll just stay in there forever. And that's a precursor to the idea of hell. And it's not something I would recommend. So a little medicine on a regular basis is a lot better to, than total immolation um, on terms other than your own.